Welcome to virtual Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair. I'm Michelle Glidden, Chief Program Officer at the Society for Science and the Public. And I have the opportunity to work on Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair throughout the year. And this year would have been my 22nd event. Um, in this session, how science of social distancing began with a science fair project, I have the honor to talk with Laura Glass, who was recently mentioned in the New York Times article about the science of social distancing for her 2006 ISEF project titled Thwarting the Pandemic, Targeted Social Distancing Strategies. So I'm pleased to introduce Laura Glass, who is currently the Student Program Fellow at the Memorial Church, Harvard University, as well as a first year proctor of the Harvard College. So Lara, why don't you start us off by just beginning the story at middle school, I think. <laughs> yes, um, first, thank you so much for, for having me. It's such an honor to, to be back in the ISEF world, truly. So it's lovely to talk with you, Michelle. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so it all really began, um, I wouldn't, I mean, science fair in my life began since I was probably eight years old. It was a feature of my life every year from, from young. Um, but my interest in infectious diseases really began in eighth grade when um, in a different class, I was learning about the, the bubonic plague in the Middle Ages in Europe and the devastating effect that that had on the um, population at that time. And I was really curious about um, what kinds of ways uh, people navigated it then and how we would navigate something like that in our current day. Um, and I was able to use a very abstract um, computer modeling system in that eighth grade year to really get a very beginning sense of how infectious diseases like um, the flu or, um, uh, yeah, like, a, like the flu in that case, um, could spread in pockets and then quickly take over the entire simulation. Um, and that abstract um, space really allowed me to, to gain a lot of interest in what it would look like to um, uh, increase the complexity of that simulation. So following that eighth grade year, ninth grade came around and I had access to a much more complex tool, co computer modeling simulation to really think about the spread of infectious diseases like the flu um, in a simulated community made up of um, what looked like my own surroundings as much as possible. I was able to put different things into the computer modeling simulation to mirror um, what my experience of my community and my city was. Um, and that elevated um, reality, rea realism in the model really spurred uh, increased interest um, in how we could possibly um, mitigate the devastation of something like a pandemic. Um, I think in the interceding time as well, I had learned more about more recent pandemics in the world, uh, the 1918 flu pandemic, as well as there being more contemporary scares like SARS and other types of avian flu that didn't take off, um, but that were very scary. Um, and so I had this renewed uh, sense of interest in really thinking about how we could approach mitigating that kind of devastation in our, in our current world. Um, and and that, yeah, and that's, and that's why you, you looked at schools in particular, right? Because obviously that was the environment you were in. Right, and as I looked, um, I was looking at schools was um, more, it was part of being able to try to, mod I mean, it was what I knew most about um, right. as a young person. Um, and I was able to talk to my family members and teachers to sort of be like, what do you do outside of work? What do you, what kind of um, communities are you a part of? So that I could try to simulate as that as well. But certainly being able to model something even um, at that early stage really helped me to, to feel how real it could be um, and how, how valuable it would be to really um, engage in, in learning more about how we could prevent something um, as devastating as these past pandemics um, to, to be as bad. Yeah, and as the computer modeling got more sophisticated, talk to us a little bit about um, the role your father had and, and mentors in general, but, but obviously I think you worked with your dad on, on um, at least on learning from his computer models and then, and then taking them on your own onto your own project. Totally. So um, when it comes to my dad, you can't really separate the scientist from the dad. Um, <laughs> my dad is, uh, is retired now, but being a scientist is, 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 is and was so much of a part of who he, he is and how he parented. So mm -hmm. you know, I have two sisters. I'm the middle child. And 
you know, everything from learning about the, the different ways we're doing chores and, and different elements that were part of the, the cleaning fluid that we would be using and why we would choose that one over another one or mm -hmm. going on hikes and learning about the mountains around us. Um, learning about science and thinking about the world through scientific inquiry was always a huge part of my, my childhood uh, because of my dad. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, so, so I was very lucky to have in him a mentor and somebody who was intrinsically interested in, in supporting me as a human growing <laughs> in the world as my father, but also as somebody who cared so much about science and so much about um, in, inviting people into learning about the world through that lens. Um, so yeah, so my dad um, was a, a huge mentor for me throughout, as I said, starting from age eight and thinking about science fair. And um, same as with my sisters um, in their own in their own ways, um, and it was, you know, it's not without its complexity. I think um, right. any mentorship is has its different any relationship has its different elements, and I think, you know, there were there were definitely moments in which I also felt um, that I needed to to frame boundaries so that I felt like um, that I I felt sometimes that people would assume that because my mentor was also my father, <laughs> that I maybe didn't do all the work um, right. in the same way. And because of that, I think that whether that was true or not, <laughs> I, I felt that. Um, and so it made me in some ways probably work even harder to, to, to convince people that, no, this is, this is something that I am doing, of course, with encouragement and support um, from my father in ways I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And also I, I really did this. And um, yeah. So that you know, it's complicated. I'm sure, sure people have. Yeah, it is, and in, in, in any competition, and and yet, in a, an important distinction, right? Yeah. Um, that a mentor can be found anywhere, and some of us are lucky enough to have that mentorship in in the family. Um, and and it was it's wonderful that your dad and and you and your sisters had those those opportunities. So then, talk to us how it transitioned a little bit, because then you actually kind of went to work with your father in 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 uh, moving this towards public policy. Yeah. So one really cool thing was that my so my work um with science fair in these sort of self-contained project um, scenarios was also led to to me being able to contribute to the work of my father and his um, colleagues at the time um, at a in their own professional context so that collaboration allowed me to integrate they integrated um, the work that I did in science fair, which was also built up, you know, in summers and throughout and beyond the science fair season. Um, I was able to continue to contribute in my own way to, to the work that then they took as professionals um, to create, uh, um, we, to publish papers and then ultimately, which then um, led to Im impacting uh, public policy. So that, that piece of it, um, was a, I was much more, much removed from um, when it actually went from, you know, the the publishing of the papers to then it becoming something that would impact policy. Um, that was not so much my my close journey, but I said my, yeah. my work certainly contributed. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's pretty cool. So talk to us a little bit. I know that once uh, we saw the New York Times article, we had several of my I know my colleagues and and uh, uh, friends and fair directors. Who reached out and obviously were loved the mention of science fair and the fact that that uh, your project uh, was so engaged and involved. So talk to us about uh, the the ICEF. You you were you went two different years. So kind of what was your experience and and how did you find it? Yeah, you know, I I can, um, participating in science fair at that level was what truly was life changing for me um, in some ways. That made sense in some ways only made sense looking back but um truly being able to be a part of something that was so high level and so international in scope so so broad in scope scope just from the number of people and where they were coming from and being able to interact with people different from me and from different parts of the world was huge um and being around people who were so excited about different elements of science and scientific inquiry and and wanting to be a part of community of peers in that way was so cool and then amidst that having you know, this context in which all of these adults are taking young people so seriously in terms of the work that they're doing and their passions and creativity. It was just a beautiful thing to be a part of. I loved my years. I felt so, so grateful to have gotten to go more than once. And um, truly, even looking back, I think that being able to participate in the International Science Fair allowed me 
um, to see the world in a much broader way and have a lot of interest in really learning more intricately, intricately about um, people and the world in, in new ways. So it was truly, it was incredible. That's excellent. And, and I think that that is a nice bridge to kind of the work that you're doing now, right? So, so community and, and community building. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about, about your role at, at Harvard University. Yeah, so interestingly, um, one thing that I feel very lucky about is that I have had the support of, in my life to explore new things, <laughs> even if they don't necessarily make complete sense and they depart a little bit with what I have done. Um, and I have always had a lot of interest in education, educational environments, and how they can be at their best to really support students holistically and getting to learn and apply their knowledge to better the world um, and to, to really fuel their passions. Uh, my mom was a high school teacher um, <laughs> growing up, so I certainly had some exposure to, to care about education in that context too. Um, and ultimately what that has meant for me is really wanting to be a part of supporting students in a co-curricular advising capacity to really be able to support them in thinking about what it is that they are interested in, what they care about in the world and how that relates to their studies. Um, so some, helping them to draw those, those connections and to really live in community with their peers to do so. So um, I hold a couple of roles at Harvard now. Um, one role which I have held, this is my fifth year doing that, is called a resident first year proctor. So I live in a first year dormitory <laughs> and um, <laughs> I support incoming students in transitioning to Harvard um, and also as many of their academic advisor, helping them to sort through all of the opportunities to really find what fuels them um, and where what the world needs and what they are interested in can really match. Um, and um, also to support them in creating community with one another and really acknowledge that that's a big part of life and that's a big part of learning um, and that we all have a role to play in that. Um, it coincides very well with my other role, which is a student program fellow at the Memorial Church of Harvard University, where um, I really support uh, students um, through programming, advising, um, worship to really connect um, how and who they want to be in the world in a very deep way um, to what they're studying and how they're going to apply what they're learning into their life and integrate it into a, a greater whole. Um, and it's really fun. I really, yeah. really love to do but it. I love that. You kind of at school forever, right? Yeah. <laughs> you get, to, you get to stay on campus. And, and I, I think that the, our jobs are similar in that way in terms of getting energy from young people, right? Um, and, and in a role that you can support them that you can you can give them um, energy and 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 uh, even even with this virtual event, I feel like there are ways that we can demonstrate to the young people who are finalists this year um, to, that that is still an international event that there is that international exchange um, and that not unlike a, a college campus, it does allow you to broaden your scope and to think um, about and learn about uh, different people um, kind of throughout throughout the world. So um, I applaud your work. I think that's awesome. Um, and I know that you have a lot of our alumni on campus, so <laughs> we'll have to make sure we, we keep you in, in connection. So a little bit back to social distancing. Um, obviously, you wrote that paper back um, before anybody had, had, it, had to actually practice social distancing. Now that we're in, in the mode that we're in now, kind of, uh, is, is it reflecting your work? How is it different? Uh, kind of, what are you, some of your thoughts around that? Yeah, you know, it, it's fascinating. I think also, um, you know, in the time that I was uh, doing my, my work, I specifically was looking at also the effect of um, keeping children and teens at home from school. Um, and of course that extends to residential colleges and mm -hmm. colleges and universities as well. But at that time I, I wasn't thinking about that as much. It wasn't my, my day to day. And now that it, that is my day to day, um, it's been sort of interesting to think about the, the parallels um, of, of that as well. I think one thing that um, has been interesting is when I, um, I remember when I was doing my work, the idea was how can we think about quarantine and social distancing, quarantine being something that has, is not new, that has been used in many different iterations of navigating infectious diseases in communities for a long time. Um, but how do we think about it in a way that's targeted so that it doesn't feel like it 
everybody has to be quarantined forever. Right. Um, right. right. And that really was the impetus for like, how do we think about this simulation? How do we sort of think about different social groups, age groups, um, to think about how we could mitigate the spread and keep people as safe and as possible while also not having everybody in quarantine. Um, so it's been interesting to think about, especially right now, as you look at some places that are thinking about opening up or how that's going to work, um, really what that means. And it's, it's very complicated. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, that that piece of it has been something that I have, have thought a lot about, which I didn't, wasn't, um, the work that I did, it never simulated everybody being at home as much as possible. I was really about how do you specifically look at in in the case of my simulation, children and teens, um, and we're we're in a different space right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and even the term of social distancing, and I know that that the the psychology of that and the community of that that um, folks have, have have tried to shift it to almost physical distancing as opposed to social, and the and the idea that technology has obviously allowed us uh, a new venue of of communicating with each other that that probably has even advanced to a point since you did your project, right? Um, yeah, oh, absolutely, I, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, so if we're, we're, we're finishing up here. Why don't you give me any, any sense of advice that you have for this year's finalists? Obviously, they're not going to get to see um, each other in, in the physical presence of, of each other. Um, we are gonna be obviously having lots of sessions and um, some of the projects will be highlighted but um, in your role now and, and as a former finalist, what, what kind of pieces of advice might you share with some of our, our students? Yeah, I think, uh, I think one is just to have the courage to, to follow your passions, which is way easier said than done. It is, it is hard. Sometimes responsibilities in life get in the way of, of being able to. So when you actually can, do it. Um, and when somebody, you have a mentor in your life that really does seem to want to support you in, in learning something new and going into a, a direction that you feel pulled, try it um, if you can. Uh, it really, I think that you, things only look, only make sense sometimes looking back and you really do need to trust your gut and stay curious. Um, and don't forget that most things in life are, are team efforts <laughs> and like really like cherish the community that you have whether it's virtual right now um, or in future, hopefully with, with science for other kinds of experiences, cherish that community, that peer community, mentors, um, spaces of learning that allow you to flourish. Um, those are really important. Um, and when you can contribute to, to being a mentor later in life, which many of you I'm sure will, um, do it. It's really, really valuable. Yeah. Yeah, I would say to absolutely echo, echo that thought. Um, never have you made a final decision in, in life's journey, right? <laughs> There's always an opportunity to change course, um, to, to say, you know what, I really love this passion and I, I'm going to go off and maybe, maybe upset the apple cart for some who have expectations for yourself. Most particularly, I think, for yourself sometimes. You set expectations early um, and high achieving students in particular have such, well, I've achieved here, so that must mean that I must do this next step. And so often, it's the bolder move to say, I'm not going to follow that path. I'm actually going to follow my passion somewhere else, which may not be what, what the world um, or my parents or even myself expect of me. Um, but, but, but great advice and, and, and wonderful to think about. Yes. All right. Um, any other last words of wisdom that you have for us that you'd like to share? Oh. <laughs> oh, I mean... I guess I just, I feel as somebody who works and has chosen to continue to work with, with young people, young adults, um, so I'm, every day I'm so inspired by um, the passion, by the commitments that, that you all have to share with us. Um, and I'm just so, I mean, I don't, I don't know any of you who are probably who are going to see this, but um, I'm really proud of you for, for following your, your passions and for doing this important work. And I really hope that um, you're able to continue to, to do that in your own ways. Thank you, Laura. And on behalf of the Re uh, Regeneron ISIF community, I wanna thank you for your time, uh, your passion and your um, advice to the students. Much appreciated. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this session and I would encourage you to take advantage of the many other sessions coming throughout the week. Thank you again, Laura. Thank you.